All right. Welcome to this episode of the Fundable, Fundable Founder. I'm here today with Julie Johnson, founder and CEO of Armored Things. Welcome, Julie. Thanks, Charlie. Great to have you on. Um, I think before we get into kind of your origin story and your fundraising success, I'd uh, love to hear just your, your description of Armored Things. What's your elevator pitch? So Armored Things is building a global data analytics platform for predicting flows of people. Uh, we call our product crowd intelligence, uh, but what we really mean is that we understand where people are in large spaces at both a 35,000 foot view level down to very granular spaces and zones. Uh, we can then do that, uh, we can then use that to do very interesting things like keep people safe, operate a space more efficiently, uh, and improve the experience within that space. Uh, so, you know, we like to compare ourselves for Google Maps of people, not cars. You can imagine if you know where people are, you can really improve their experience the same way that we all rely on Google Maps or Waze every day. Yeah, and, and I'm sure that's, um, you know, this is going from a, a much more of a need to have in a post-pandemic type world as well as we think about uh, how people utilize their spaces going forward. Yeah, I think there's a heightened awareness of wanting to know where people are uh, and reimagining what that can be used for. So like I said, you know, before COVID, it was really for general security and staffing, operating efficiency. Uh, we've seen that get additional applications when you think about uh, zone-based alerting. You know, I don't wanna have more than a hundred people in this space, it's not safe. You know, I can set a great policy, but how do I make sure people are actually respecting right. my policy to decrease the risk? Uh, that's really where we come in and we can help make sure that it's not just lip service, that people are actually maintaining the safe posture that I actually want as a guest or employee or fan or student coming into the space. That's exactly right. Well, great. Um, so, um, so take us back three and a half years to when you decided to start Armored Things. What, what's your origin story? Yeah, so I was actually getting uh, my MBA at Harvard when I decided uh, that I wanted to get into the world of venture capital. Uh, and anyone who knows uh, you know, how hard it is to break into a new industry, one of the approaches that I've used before is pitching your own job description. So I mm -hmm. went out and met every entrepreneur, investor, accelerator, product manager that would talk to me, and then pitched ideas to different VCs, uh, both in Boston and the Bay Area. So I ended up at Qualcomm Ventures, uh, where I was really in between an R&D team and the venture capital team, focused on a thesis uh, that I had pitched them around security and IoT. So that's really where I fell in love with this um, you know, broad market thesis around data and data proliferating in our environments from the adoption of IoT uh, and a need to uh, you know, keep our physical world safe, but also our digital world safe because of the vulnerabilities some of those things create. Long story short, that has nothing to do with what Armored Things does today, <laughs> except for the themes of data and security still right. being fundamentally a really big part of our business. So as I was finishing grad school, uh, one of my partners from, from Qualcomm Ventures actually said, hey, I think I'm gonna start a company in this domain. Uh, and we very quickly realized that we could use all this data to try and keep people safe. And that was the genesis of the name Armored Things. How do we use data from all these devices in real time to help keep people safe and ultimately also improve the operational environments they live in. Uh, and, and that's really what we do today. Yeah, and, I, and I'll, I'll say that you've always had kind of that mission of keeping people safe and that's been core to your story from day one and, and still is today. Absolutely. Um, but even safe from things like, you know, pan, you know <laughs> COVID, right? So, yeah, you <laughs> which know, wasn't on the radar then. It certainly wasn't. And, and what's interesting is how that's evolved. You know, so we did start out with the security mission. You know, over time, we got pulled by customers into more of, you know, security and operations. Uh, and then COVID hit. And we've really doubled down, you know, back on that original mission, which doesn't mean that we're neglecting the rest of it, but rather to say, um, you know, security, unfortunately, doesn't always get invested in until a bad thing happens. You right. know, we'd all like to think that people buy insurance before an accident. But unfortunately, sometimes it takes seeing something bad happen to say, oh, I really need to prepare myself and protect myself against that. Uh, and so we're seeing people really reinvest uh, in a future where pandemics don't seem like this amorphous, impossible thing, but rather something that we need to have a preparedness posture around. And so we think that's kind of here to stay, even if the near term, uh, you know, kind of improves tremendously. Great. So take us back to 
the start of Armored Things and how you thought about fundraising. How did you kind of piece together how much of a team did you want to put together? How much of a product did you want to develop? How much customer traction did you want to get? And then how did you think about funding around that? What was the overall strategy? Yeah, so uh, we met our technical co or I met my co technical co-founder, uh, Chris Lord, uh, right around the time we were going out to raise our first institutional capital. Uh, and, you know, the critical advantage of bringing Chris onto the team when we did is that Chris had operating experience building a company called Carbon Black in Boston. That's an endpoint security company, very well respected, was positioning towards a major exit. Uh, and, you know, he brought a lot of credibility immediately to our senior leadership team and was, you know, became a co-founder of this business. Uh, that also was a recruiting advantage. So we yep. started pulling like talent out of leading Boston area companies. Uh, so we spent a lot of time talking about our team and we spent a lot of time talking about why pulling people from cybersecurity had parallels to our market, you know, the world of physical security. Uh, and so it's really important how we painted that picture of that team, especially because the technology we're building is complicated. Right. We didn't have the luxury of spending, you know, less than six figures to get to our initial prototype and test it in the market. Uh, I, I would have loved that, uh, but unfortunately, we're really building something that's almost a more of a critical infrastructure play. We're tapping into uh, existing technologies and using AI to predict patterns of behavior. Unfortunately, you can't build that in two weeks. So it was right. so important that we talked about our team, uh, really important that we could illustrate what customers were saying. So we did, I think, go out uh, with a number of letters of intent from people saying, this is the original vision of the product. We're very interested uh, in seeing it get built. Uh, and I would say for a product where you can't do that initial prototyping and have people really commit to buy your first iteration, LOIs are a pretty good signal. They are. So we didn't have that. We had a couple of interesting industry leaders uh, and you know we raised a seed round. Now, as we were closing our seed round, we were also learning from those customers that there were pieces of our initial hypothesis that didn't work. So we were very transparent through that process that you know, hey, some of the things we're doing with devices really aren't about the devices. It's really about data and, and talking with our prospective investors about how we were thinking about the evolution of the business. That might mean that some of those LOI customers go away. That might mean that new ones come in. Uh, and really the key there is transparency because the biggest thing is you're being judged uh, as organizational leaders who are thoughtful and strategic yep. and are not going to blindly plow forward when the market is telling you otherwise. That's right. Yeah. And, um, and so when you did go out to talk to VCs and, and others, um, you know, what was, what was the, what were the initial conversations like? What were some of the feedback you got that you used to help, help you tell your story better? Yeah, I think one of the things that I learned early on, and I'm still, you still learn it every time you fundraise, you re, you relearn some of the lessons uh, was remembering that, you can't just tell the story of your near-term opportunity, right. but you need to tell the story of your bigger opportunity down the road to really paint the full market potential. Uh, you know, our near-term market opportunity at the time was very much in universities, um, you know, kind of a very specific security application. Uh, it wasn't right away that we saw all the other applications of the same product and that we saw that, you know, at our core, we weren't just a security application, but rather we're really a data platform, you know, predicting human behavior, that's a much bigger market opportunity. Right. Uh, and I continuously try and figure out how to tell that story better uh, because that opens up the world of investors tremendously. There's a lot of investors who say, I don't really get the security market, but we all have experience understanding people and knowing that people are messy. We don't do things that are predictable. We're right. random. You know, if mm -hmm. I might be walking one place and then turn around and walk somewhere else, right? How do we uh, help understand that in the context of our environments. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think reminding yourself uh, that even though you need to have a near-term business plan uh, to always anchor to that kind of moonshot, where could you go in the long term is, is actually, you know, probably very important as you go through these conversations. Do you find that in the conversation that starting with the vision is best and then talking about how you're going to get there? Or do you start with what your near-term opportunity is and then finish with the big vision? It somewhat depends on the investor. Mm -hmm. uh, so some, you know, 
before every meeting, I spend at least a half hour, if not an hour, you know, digging into the portfolio, digging into the investor and really trying to understand, uh, you know, the, the market thesis that would draw them to armored things right. or potential parallels in their portfolio. Uh, if I see someone has a lot of experience with, you know, enterprise B2B operational tools, I might focus a little bit more on the near-term crowd intelligence product that is kind of our first vertical test of being this much bigger platform play. Uh, if I see that someone loves platform plays, trust me, I'm going to the big vision <laughs> and then talking about how we're selling it near term, right? So uh, it really depends on the investor. Uh, oftentimes, even in the opening comments and how someone introduces themselves, which is mm -hmm. always how you should start out the meeting, you'll get a gauge of where their passion lies and how they think of themselves. Uh, and to a certain extent, you're almost mirroring that back to them. If they care a lot about horizontal platforms, big vision, don't talk about your narrow first application right. first. That's great advice. And I just think the idea of researching, going into the meetings, right? And finding that common ground, as well as, like you said, mirror their interests, right? And if they're, if they're guiding you towards big picture stuff, talk about big picture stuff. Right. <laughs> That's, it, it seems so simple, but it's, um, but that's a, it's something that takes time to learn. And it's a discipline, right? Yep. You know, once you actually kick off a process, things tend to move quickly or you'll have things back to back. It's very easy to let that prep slide. Uh, but I can't tell you the difference when you go in, you know, ready, really ready to like kind of hit the key points for this investor versus, you know, you're, you're feeling a little strapped, you're hungry, you're tired. Uh, you haven't done the research. It's just, uh, you want to set the stage appropriately. Exactly. Now, what about just contacting those first investors? Did you, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you got a few warm introductions along the way, as well as some cold outreach. I mean, any techniques or things that didn't work or worked well with kind of that initial outreach when you're an unknown entity? Yeah, you know, and I think, um, you know, so we had raised some capital from friends and family, mm -hmm. um, you know, earlier than we raised institutional capital. Many of them actually had Seed, seed stage investor contacts that they were able to introduce us to. Uh, and then at the seed stage, there's a lot of collaboration. Yes. Uh, you know, I think later you might find more competition for deals, things like that. But at the seed stage, uh, a lot of folks are really trying to understand, you know, what is the universe of startups and not all startups are, you know, located in one specific room in one specific city. You have to do a lot of networking to right. find them. And on the startup side, you really have to do a lot of networking to find these seed investors. Uh, so we, we definitely spent time uh, working with our existing friends and family investors. Uh, you know, one of my partners had some established VC relationships, though they tended to be later stage. Uh, you know, there we could ping those folks and say, hey, who are some great seed investors uh, you might know? Uh, and then when we meet seed investors, you know, oftentimes they say, you know, this isn't really my area, but have you guys spoken with X? Right. Uh, right. And again, it, it's uh, a pretty congenial network at that early stage where they're willing to say, hey, you should talk to these guys. I'm happy to throw in an intro. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think at the seed stage, it's a most people play very friendly in the sandbox. Um, you need you need a you need to have those relationships. You need to make sure there's a good syndicate of investors who can help support this company through the early bumps in the road to get to a series A. So um yeah, I think using those relationships works really well. Um, any kind of final pieces of advice or anything that we haven't touched on that you'd like to share? Uh, I think the hardest thing on your first fundraise is perseverance. <laughs> you know, just, just going through it, right? I think it sometimes feels like a Sisyphean task, right? You're continuously <laughs> rolling this ball up the hill. Uh, but unlike, you know, the, the Greek mythology, you can actually get to the top, right? You yep. know, and, and that's the thing that's going to help you take your business to the right level. So you have to keep your eye on the fact that bringing in new partners uh, is not for capital. It's really to bring in differentiated viewpoints and experience that can help you elevate your business. Uh, and you're going to get a lot of no's, right? You know, you, you only need one date to the prom. Yep. Uh, you're going to look at a lot of people and say, is this who I want to go to the prom with? Uh, and they're going to look at you and say the same thing. And it can be really discouraging, right? It can be very discouraging, uh, but it's also fun, right? If you approach it the right way, you actually refine your ability to tell your story, which pays dividends for sales. It pays dividends for partners, uh, but I'm not going to say it's pain-free. No. Uh, so, you know, perseverance is everything. 
I firmly believe uh, in preparing before you launch your fundraise. Uh, Charlie, you know this about me already, but you know I probably stage my data room, you know, a month before even finishing my my deck. Uh, but it it pays dividends down the road. You know, yep. you have someone lean in. You don't want to say to them, "Ooh, we don't have any of that right. pulled together yet. <laughs> Give me a month." Right? You right. know, that's not going to play well. Uh, they're going to assume that's also how you run your business. Uh, so make sure you do the work. Make sure you do the prep. Don't get discouraged by the nose, uh, and just keep swimming. Yeah, no, that's great. I think that's great advice, Julie. And I think a couple things you've touched on that I think are really valuable is you know you kind of had this mission. Uh, of safety that helped you attract some really good talent who wanted to be around that mission, which I think is great. You combine that talent with this great vision and your preparation for those meetings. And you were able to find investors who shared that, that same vision and saw a team in place that could achieve that vision. And that's, that's what I think uh, helped you get that boulder to the top of the mountain. <laughs> we're still pushing. Yes. <laughs> um, I always like to finish by asking, um, how would you describe yourself in one word? Resilient. I knew you were going to say that. That's fantastic. <laughs> All right. Well, Try thank you. Tell me no. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Julie. I really appreciated this. Uh, great. Good luck with Armored Things. Thanks, Charlie. To innovate, invent, and disrupt. We're your partner to fuel your growth. Contact us to learn more.